Hello, and welcome to Conversation with the Socialist on GPS, also on SOGAM, which is Socialist uh, Green Autistic uh, Network. I am here with, uh, it looks like Madam Robin Hood, or I guess I'll be calling Robin. Um, now, did you say you're on, I think with Twitter, did you say you were running for office or considering it? In 2024, Green Party uh, presidential run. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have any previous uh, experience with that? With running for office? Yeah. No. Um, I started this, those videos that uh, I have on the channel are from 2018. So I initially started it <clears throat> as just a commentary for the upcoming 2020 election. And it was originally Robin Hood for 2020. And then um, Bernie got into the race and I kind of felt like you know, the socialist angle was being addressed. So I, I dropped the channel. Uh, but uh, 2020 kind of changed everything for everybody, didn't it? So, so. Certainly, yes, uh, COVID, uh, Trump, and everything else between regards to that. And concerns about the Democrats decided to run against uh, a minute for all, all that in swing states, which they, I, I don't think the Democrats really care about winning those states. Either way, it's the same donors. Uh, that's just my opinion, but I, I have, I, it seems like I have been proven right over and over again about that. So, um, and with uh, Bernie Sanders uh, dropping off so early in the primaries of 2020, um, and finding out that he, I'm pretty sure he knows the DNC is a private corporation. And given the fact that he uh, has run twice as a Democrat instead of being independent, which he should have, um, that just tells me he's explicit in knowing that, that the de Democrats are corporations and yet he still caucuses with them and stuff of that nature. Yeah, I agree. I think he should have run independent both times. Absolutely. I mean, especially considering he wasn't taking big PAC money, it was small dollar donations. He wasn't, you know, what, what was he getting out of running as a Democrat, really, you know? I mean, just a lot of obfuscation and obstacles put in his path, the whole thing. I mean, I guess the, the big, the most important thing would be access to the debate stage, right? Like if you run as an independent or as, you know, say he had run for the Greens, he wouldn't have access to the debate stage, but like how important is that really? For somebody like Bernie Sanders, with the name recognition that he has, especially after 2016, with that whole rigging, you know, he most definitely should have run as an independent in 2020, been on the ballot, you know, everything being equal. I think we could have had a Bernie Sanders president really changed history, right, if he had gone that route. But there's nothing we can do about it now. Pretty much, yeah, we, we can just learn from his mistakes and not make the same mistakes with regards to just a society of, of, of uh, in some cases, socialist wannabes and others, actual socialists or Marxists, as far as that part goes. Uh, he, he actually, uh, him and Howie Hawkins were the inspiration behind uh, me becoming a YouTuber, a podcaster, and so on and so forth. Um, in regards to Bernie Sanders, actually, he would have done better if he would have gone through the uh, free and equal debates. Now, that not only would have grown his uh, his constituency, his voter base, but it would have also uh, put to light uh, the independence of political parties uh, nowadays. But he decided to again run with the Democrats because of their platforms. But he could have helped build a platform instead of uh, trying to reform the current. I agree. I agree. I, you know, and it's like Nina Turner announcing that she's going to run. Um, she's been a little unclear as to what party she's running with, but she's almost certainly going to run as a Democrat, you know? Yeah, no, she, she, and, wasn't she, she was an Ohio representative or a, a uh, congressperson as a Democrat. Yeah. And she is one of the leading voices behind, uh, I want to say with the Our Revolution or uh, the uh, MPP, which if you, if, if you can't be an independent party, if so many of your figureheads or, or uh, voices are of the, the, the establishment. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I went to school in DC, I went to Georgetown, and I worked on the Hill um, for my congressman from Florida at the time. And we got to go to, 
he was a Republican, we got to go to the Republican club. And the Democrats have their version of the, uh, you know, the Democratic club, but basically, you know, it's an extremely fancy and expensive restaurant where all the waiters, you know, know all of the representatives names right, the new class that comes in and everything, and you just kind of waltz in and get a free 500 to $5,000 meal, right, and it's paid for by the party. I have no idea how many millions of dollars they spend on this club a year, but both parties do it, and so like, you know, I went to lobby dinners, I went to, you know, uh, retreats, like when people tend to want to look at just the donors, right? Like, where's the money coming from? That's, that's why they're voting, or that's why they're sticking with the Democrats. But there's a lot of soft incentives, a lot of um, peripheral grift, you know, that makes it real nice and cozy to be in one of the big parties, right? Like, Bernie Sanders as an independent doesn't get to go to the Democrat club and have his fancy meals paid for for free, right? He And, and schmooze like that in the backroom deals. Like, Almost certainly when you're talking about these backroom deals, they're probably starting over dinner at either the Democratic Club or the Republican Club. You know, that's and like once you get to office, it's not like a lot of these people who are even running have ever been to D.C. They've never worked at the Capitol. They don't really know what they're getting into when they run for office. Most of their activities are in their home state. Right. They're hustling groundwork like look at AOC. Rashida Tlaib, you know, these people, like, I don't think any of them had ever, they might have been to the Capitol, but I don't think they'd been underneath the Capitol, you know, seeing what like the, um, the, the, the cafeteria layout is like, do the underground shuttles, you know, they don't have that kind of inside knowledge. And then they get there and it's like, if you play ball, right, if, if you stay part of the club and vote our way or vote Pelosi or do this thing, then you get access to these elitist perks that make you feel rich, right? So like on the salaries that they're on, considering DC rent for like a tiny, tiny apartment, right? Like I'm talking one bedroom, kitchen, maybe 500 square feet. You're looking at two, $3,000 a month, right? If you're a representative. So if their, their salary is being over hundred grand a year, you got to think after taxes and then the cost of living in DC, it's coming out. I mean, it's still cushy, salary right but it's not going to make you a millionaire for sure it's just not but you get to live the millionaire lifestyle when you first get there with these lobby dinners with all of that right so it starts to feel real nice and you start to feel real fancy right and you don't want to lose hold of that even if you're not taking those corporate dollars whatever and then like when the pressure gets on for re-election it's like oh, well, I didn't deliver for my small dollar donors because it's difficult. Like, I don't want to lose my place. Maybe I just take one corporate donor, right? And that's kind of, you know, like people think Nancy Pelosi showed up an old hag in DC and she didn't. Like, if you look at videos of her from when she first started out, she was a Medicare for all supporter. She advocated for it. And I just saw a video the other day from like the 90s maybe even the 80s, where she's making the same excuses as to why we can't have Medicare for all that AOC is making today. Almost exactly the same. So she didn't show up a millionaire and evil and the way we think of her today. It was a slow wearing down process that the parties do to everybody who shows up that's a part of them. And it's been going on for decades and decades and decades. I think it's, it's foolish to believe that you can have this power structure where people really believe that DC is the center of the universe. Like when I lived there, I thought everyone outside of DC was like a minion. And I was just like an intern, right? But like the whole city vibes like that, you know, like DC is the center of the empire. And if you're not in DC, you don't know what's really going on, you know? And they all kind of feel that way. And they're not entirely wrong because the back hallways, like a lot of interns know more about what's going on than the media than we do, right? So to be fair, they do have access to power, but that's not gonna change from the inside. That's not something you can show up and be like, I'm a Democrat and announce and run and like agree to those 
like rigged primaries because we know they're rigged because they argued in a legal court case that they had the right as a corporation to rig their own primaries. So you legitimize that process, you participate, you take small dollar donations and just bleed them, you know, like what are you paying for? Like millions of dollars in ad campaigns, it's just wasted money, just throwing away money, throwing it away, throwing it away on mailers, you know? You're not gonna change it. You just, you just not, you, you can't join the club and be like, I don't agree with anything you're doing at the same time. And I think it's really been disheartening for a lot of people to see these people that we have a lot of faith in or that we have a lot of hope for, you know, I think that they aren't necessarily bad intention when they start off, but we see them start to slowly, you know, give up their power, give up their principles, make bad votes, you know, do this kind of thing. And people get super disheartened. And it's like, you can't, it's a predictable process. Don't despair, you know, it's just, they're not your heroes, right? They're, they're politicians, they represent you, stay on top of it. Don't feel like you have to make excuses for anybody. You know, like, we'll give her time. They're brand new representatives. Okay, well, the squad has been there for two years now. They've all been reelected. How long do you wait? Like, is it 10 years? Is it 20 years before you see them exercise some sort of power? Like, what are we waiting for exactly? Yeah, well, we're waiting for people to get their heads out of butts and vote for the people that will actually deliver uh, and not be associated with Democrats or Republicans in regards to party affiliation. But to they should take, I think, a public oath that they will never uh, take corporate money, that they will, will only fight for Medicare for All and other socialist-related uh, 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 policies and statutes that become that, that can become law. That's the only way that the left wing version of socialism will get into offices. Uh, that's at least that's how I look at it in regards to political philosophy. Uh, that was the biggest danger in regards to past communist and uh, and socialist uh, states that they never put the left wing policies into actual statutes to where. If you wanted to repeal them like they did with the Affordable Care Act, take it to court and see if you can get over overridden. They never did that. They only put it as policies that can easily be, be uh, overturned. Right. And like even as an oath, right? Like, so say, for example, we did, you know, all the, the Justice Democrats and other people who are progressive leaning, like, say they took an actual oath. What's, what's the enforceability of that oath? Right? Do we have them sign? Re re rejection like, of membership and rejection of any uh, endorsement, of rejection, basically kill out the careers. I mean, I think it should be more severe than that. I think it should be, you know, basically like a contract, a legally binding contract that requires you to resign. Yeah, that, that, that's what that's what uh, uh, overall I'm, I'm referring to in regards to that. That, that would be the public oath and they will be signing on camera and for it to be live streamed. So that the, the party that they are affiliated with that is not Democrat or Republican can see, okay, this person is with us, this person is running for uh, what we want, what we need as a, as a country and society. Well, and the problem is with something like that, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know, I'm also a lawyer. So with, with any sort of, of hmm? I was not aware of that. <laughs> yes, I'm also a lawyer in Texas and I'm licensed in Florida as well. So I'm a lawyer and I'm, you know, I do advocacy and other stuff as well, other than the Madam Robin Hood cosplay. Um, but with a contract, you have to have what's called privity, right? Like you've got to, you've got to have parties, people who have actually signed on to it for it to be enforceable. So say they sign this oath. Um, it can't be with the American people because there's not going to be anybody who has standing in order to sue them to enforce it. So say they sign it, they're supposed to resign, right? Like there's, what if they don't? They're like, well, no, it's a bad time. If I resign, a Republican is going to get put in, you know? Um, mm -hmm. You would have to sue them to enforce it. And nobody is, is technically a party to the contract that would be able to sue them to make it happen. Yeah. What you could do is maybe from within the party structure, 
right? So, I, you know, I support the Green Party. I think that we should grow what we already have, you know, use the, the resources at hand because we don't have a lot of time with climate change approaching. But, you know, pe there's the People's Party and the movement to start this new party, you know, maybe they could do it because they would, they would be a corporation. The candidates that they run could sign some sort of loyal, loyalty pledge like that. And then if they didn't stay within the caucus, you know, then they would have standing to sue, to sue them to resign, right? But it's never been done. There's nothing like that in our legal code. We don't know if a court would enforce that, if they're gonna force like an elected member of Congress to resign, it's just, it just exemplifies, like even on, in our best efforts, if we tried to create some sort of legally enforceable way to make our representatives actually represent us, the structure isn't designed to make them do that. It's a representative de democracy, not a democracy. So it's designed to give them the freedom to screw us <laughs> whenever they feel like without consequence. I mean, Jesus, look at how terrible these Republicans are, right? Like, yeah. and, and so many of them got reelected. You know, here in Texas, Ted Cruz getting reelected was just... Well, to be fair, he, he, won, he won a race to uh, the white Obama, basically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, a war was basically the trying to be uh, what uh, oh, the, the woman that was, was going against Mitch McConnell. The, uh, he was... Uh, Amy McGrath, yeah. Yeah. She was trying to be more Trumpish than McConnell, which there is nobody like that. Yeah, uh, and he was, and he was trying to be like what Obama was in no way in twelve, but well, unfortunately during a, during this during this era, uh, the whole Obama uh, mystique have went away. Yeah, and he lost by how many points? Uh, it was not. It was close. It wasn't a whooping like the Democrats usually get. It was close. I think it was within a few points. Right. Yeah. And I remember just after that, he decided to run for president. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, maybe when, well, um, I, 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 I was going to say something, but now they're going against Howie Hawk because he hasn't won any uh, political office yet. But um, uh, and. At least with Howie Hawkins, he had not only the detail, but the uh, past uh, um, activist uh, side of things. And just his overall, like how he's fought for uh, for unions and fought for uh, Green Party and Socialist Party and uh, the, uh, what, uh, the IWA, I think it was, or is. Um, I mean, he at least has a passive, like pro-socialist type of activism, whereas in a war kid was a was a city councilman, right, or was it a uh, state state representative? Who? Huh? What did you say? Who who was? A war. I want to say a war. I, I could be wrong about that. As far as his last name. What What was Beto? Beto was a congressperson. Congressperson, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, from El Paso, he was a U.S. congressperson. Did they step away from being a congressperson to run for for uh, for president or? Uh, did, he win, did, did, did he not even go for re-election? He didn't go for re-election um, after, so the Senate run foiled him on re-election for Congress, right? You can only do one. So he lost his seat and then went immediately to running for president. Right. And Ted Cruz is known as to be one of the uh, most non-respected persons in, in government and he still lost them. Oh yeah, no, Beto sh should have for sure won, but his strategy was terrible. So he wanted to do that faux populist, um, you know, I, I think actually, I think Beto actually like as a person is progressive, right? He used to be in a rock band, he's kind of trending cool. I think he as a person is actually like at the core of him, a good guy. And when he was in Congress, he had a lot of good votes, right? He's a pretty good guy. But I think when the problem is, is particularly with the major parties, right? 
what happens is like when they're at the the con congressional level those campaign managers are usually like people they know or somebody local right it's not big business right, right? And, and it can be if you're somebody like a bush and you want yourself a congressional seat then yeah you go big business you know consultant and you get you spend all that money and that kind of stuff but for someone like beto or somebody who's grassroots they're just using the people they have on hand or that they know but once you get to the senate level and certainly at the presidential level you're no longer especially from the party's perspective if you win the primary those local grassroots advisors aren't going to cut it because that like how do they grift that way right like how do they spend tens of millions of dollars if you're just using your person that you're paying 40 50 g's to no we got we got to get our two million dollar consultant money right so when he went statewide for senate <laughs> his campaign strategy changed and it noticeably changed because it got you know it, it got these corporate advisors it got this you know money systemed um input into it that he had not had when he was a congressperson right and so these big brained people who i'm almost for certain are not texans right they're from the national scene and they're like oh well let me tell you how you do a populist race in texas right he wanted to go to every county in texas texas has over 200 counties some of them only have a couple thousand people living in them, right? Like if you're running a statewide election and you're trying to get the most number of votes, what freaking sense does it make to spend half of your tour, right? In, in sparsely populated areas of Texas for the sake of saying that you went to every county in Texas right it's a waste of time it's a waste of money so he spent his entire campaign going county to county to county you know and it and it slowed him way the heck down because some of these venues right some of these counties some of these stops you know you see him on the trail and stuff there's only a couple of dozen people there so his crowds look real small but the fact of the matter is that county's only got a thousand people right so the fact that he got 50 100 people out you know, during the middle of the week is actually fairly impressive, especially in backwoods country, but it doesn't look that way optically, right? It doesn't, it doesn't build momentum. Like if you want to take the state, you do what Ted Cruz did. And he said, like, forget the rural parts of Texas, they'll handle themselves, right? Like, I don't need to be worrying about the rural parts of Texas. So he hit major metropolitan areas hard, right he hit the surrounding areas and metropolitan areas hard which are strongly uh republican and not just strongly republican strongly moneyed republican so if you're looking in dallas like grapevine outside of dallas county like all those areas all the wealthy conservatives some of them live inside the city but they move out you know to the surrounding area right so he'd hit up these big these big areas do large donation drives right for his little crew do his speeches get these big crowds going you know and move on to the next one and so despite how much people hate ted cruz because texans hate ted cruz like i'm gonna tell you like even the people that voted for Te ted cruz they just don't like democrats they don't like ted cruz they just really do not like democrats <laughs> yes, uh, so he he eked it out man he eked it out if 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 Beto had been smart and had mobilized Austin, had mobilized Houston and mobilized Dallas and had mobilized El Paso, which I, El Paso is a lot smaller than those other three, but it's, it's still representative of a good portion of the border, you know, some West Texas and stuff like that and got these big crowds, got a lot of energy, right? And let that spread through the rest of the state and prioritized grassroots volunteers in the counties that he wanted to hit right i think he could have i think he could have pulled it out but you know his advisors like they want to do fake trump populism and at the same time while he's doing this tour he's like backpedaling on medicare for all and that was like the nail in the coffin for texans like texans are very um 
they can be loyal conservative, but I tell you what, the conservatives here, registered Republicans, man, they will throw their own people under the bus, no problem, right? Like we've had city, like um, different reps and seats and all sorts of stuff, they'll shuffle, you know, like the Republicans will in mass vote against somebody that they do not like because they pissed them off. They're not the most, you know, they're not super, super loyal the way that you get in other Southern states, right? They're winnable yeah. if you can piss them off, but not if you're gonna lie. Like if you're gonna wishy-washy, you got nothing to offer, you've changed as a person between who you were as a representative and who you wanna be as a Senator, anyone who you were gonna get to defect is done with you. Cause that's just like Ted Cruz. Yeah. I'm not gonna abandon my loyalty to the Republicans for the sake of a faker, you know, forget that. But I think legitimately, you know, Texans was blue for over a hundred years, you know, until the, until Karl Rove and the Southern strategy and all sorts of, you know, and it turned it red. It's a relatively new feature of Texas. It was a very liberal progressive place for most of its history. You know, we're very well integrated for the most part, you know, like we've got some segregation issues, but not nearly as bad as the rest of the South. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think the Green Party could actually do quite well here just because so many Texans are disappointed in the Democrats and the Republicans are just god awful. I mean, they run, they're running Texas into the ground. Yeah. Uh, our, uh... Is now I know there's no uh, there's not ranked way to vote in there, but is there a movement to get that going? So um, one of the things I want to focus on. So there's a candidate, Delilah for Texas. She's running for governor. Yes, I. I the Green Party. I have interviewed her this once. Oh yeah, isn't she sweetheart? Oh yeah. So, yeah. Uh, she seems well qualified. Uh, especially uh, concerned about that uh, she's a frontliner in regards to uh, her job occupation. Mm -hmm. and I think she'd be really good for the office. Uh, I think she's going for governor of Texas. Yes, yeah, she's going for governor and um, I'm assisting her with her campaign. So we we had a our first briefing call the other day. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm back in Texas, I was in Florida for most of 2020 dealing with family stuff. So yeah. 2021 is just, off to the races, you know? Yeah. So we were discussing kind of our strategy for what we wanna, um, how we wanna grow the Green Party and our direct action while building our campaigns at the same time. Like my priority is not as much my campaign, like that. that's great and all, but I think that this whole campaign strategy of wasting millions of dollars on TV advertising and pamphlets is just burning money right? When that same amount of money could send, you know, like every household in the area a meal, right? Just slap a campaign sticker on it. But it's like, hey, we heard you might be hungry. Here's some food, right? So let, why, why do our leaders think campaigning has to be these intangible wastes of money? Like, why can't they use this opportunity like Bernie Sanders did once the pandemic hit and he dropped out. He regeared his entire campaign and the fundraising to actually support like community needs, right? Like it stopped going to his campaign and that advertising and all of that and it started going to support food banks and that kind of stuff. I feel like campaigns should be like that all the time. So one of the things that we're looking at when we're trying to talk about revitalizing the Texas Green Party is what can we do with direct action and what policies do we wanna focus on? And ranked choice voting is the policy priority I think uh, we should be looking into as far as like this kind of two-pronged strategy of direct action policy, right? So the problem with ranked choice voting in Texas is it's actually illegal here. Like the code specifically prohibits ranked choice voting. So I've been put in touch with um, the national director. Um, I forget the name of the organization, but it's a ranked choice, it's for ranked choice voting. And he connected me with the person in Texas working on changes to Texas electoral system. Now, 
what they're doing here in Texas is be, because ranked choice voting to get it in Texas would require one of two things. It'll either require a referendum, which I think is the only way we're going to get it. And that takes time to put together to get the signatures, right, to get the approval and to get it on the ballot. Yeah. Or the legislature needs to revoke the statute that makes it illegal and institute a new statute that has ranked choice voting, which we have an entirely Republican uh, Senate and House. So it's just, I mean, it's not entirely Republican, yeah. but it's its a solid majority Republican. They're never giving us ranked choice voting in the legislature. So the only way we'd ever get it is through a referendum, which we have almost, we have referendums on almost every ballot right here in Texas. Like they, they happen all the time. So it, it is doable. But the people who are already working on ranked choice voting here, because of those obstacles, they don't want to burn time um, on ranked choice voting yet. They're looking, they're trying, like I just talked to him yesterday about this. So they're trying to do a different strategy at a local level to get um, the law changed and then work from there. So I have the name of it, what do you call it? Um, it's called approval voting. Okay. Or star voting. So they're working to try and get approval voting instead of RCV um, for the Austin City Council elections. Mm -hmm. So they're trying on like the local level to get it changed so that you can get, um, I think in, I, like I haven't had a chance to look into it. So the upshot basically is that it's gonna be a struggle here in Texas to get it. And the people who are working on it are ready in Texas aren't even working like the, the national director. They are, but they're not, they're working on other things, right? Other than that. So that's one of the things that I wanna do is make sure that we are also, um, he said there's another advocacy center here that's pushing for ranked choice voting referendum, but that's like way in works. So what I wanna do is something similar here to what the Greens are doing in Florida. So in Florida, the Greens have teamed up, teamed up with the Libertarians and the other third parties to work collaboratively mm -hmm. to get ranked choice voting. And they don't have it yet, but they've been working together. My understanding, I think it's like been at least since last year when I talked to the director of the Florida Greens or um, he was posting about it. It's, you know, it's been at least since last year, but they're actually combining you know, the resources that they have as third parties in order to make it happen. And I think that's a smart strategy and one that could work in Texas. Like, to be frank, the Greens got wiped out in 2020. I mean, we were just <sighs> annihilated by the Libertarians. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember the, I remember seeing the, uh, the nationwide vote and uh, Joe, uh, Joe Jordanson uh, from Libertarian got like 3% three, three of the vote while Howie Hawkins got like what one maybe point five. Yeah, it, it COVID nineteen definitely uh, damaged the Free Brain Party as well as the end the end fighting. Uh, yeah, that damaged it too. That's the uh, side effect of not being a centralized party. If they were a centralized party, then yes, it's more more or less could be more corruptible. But at the same time, you would, you would be communicating with everybody and helping everybody out at the same time. Yeah. There would be more organized, uh, organizational skills uh, promoted instead of, okay, you guys do you, guys do you and we'll do us, sort of way. Yeah. Well, and the infighting, you know, that happened between um, Howie and some of the other candidates, you know, I feel like a lot of that was, the, the timing was certainly suspect, right? 
it seems to happen, you know, at critical moments. And some of this was some of the candidates didn't um, do what they needed for ballot access in the individual states, right? They didn't follow the rules. So they didn't end up on the ballots, yeah. right? And then they went around and said, it's being handed to Howie, right? He, he's a cheater. And they spread that whole narrative through a substantial part of the primary process, right? And like, I think that the, the Green Party is a little old, right? The, the people who founded it decades ago are still um, running for stuff, right? They're still in control of things. And really what we need is like a, a youth led movement, right? Like the Green Party needs revitalization from young people. It needs young people in leadership positions. It needs young people kind of directing things and, and instigate, you know, involved. And so it, how it was an easy target because he's, he's one of the original founders of, of some sort of like nepotism isn't the right word, you know, but favoritism, like, like how he was given favoritism. He, he, he was a good target for that. But the reality was, is that his campaign was strongest. He's been involved with the Greens the longest, right? And so like, as far as crossing the T's and dotting the I's so that his campaign could get ballot access in the primary in the different states, he had more resources. He knew more people, right? He knew the process, he just hustled. And so like these candidates that went on this, this tear, you know, and it seems like a lot of them have just disappeared, right? That whole campaign about how, how, how it was the cheater or whatever, right? And all the bots on Twitter and all of that, they like evaporated into nothingness, right? Yeah, uh, I offered to actually uh, interview a couple of them just kind of to the other, other side of it. And nothing took me up on the opportunity as far as that part goes. Uh, but two, I think that Howie Hawkins, to a certain degree, kind of uh, did himself a little bit because he brought in the Green Party establishment uh, to be his, the foundation of his uh, of his campaign. If, yeah. he, if maybe he would have uh, gone with the uh, like not not fresh faces necessarily, but people who are not on committees who are not a part of this or that, but Green Party members uh, be behind them as campaign and get that vote out, then there would have been almost nothing for his, uh, for his Chris and for his critic to say. There, right. would, there wouldn't have been, you know, uh, doxing uh, uh, accusations and other things of that nature. All that didn't go towards Howie Hawkins and went towards his campaign manager. Yeah, well, and he did, he had, um... I, I can't remember, you know, was it like the communications director, the digital director, but he had some characters yeah, no, in his no. campaign, you know, who- From what I heard it was both. Hmm? From what I heard it was both. Uh, and, but the funny thing about that whole deal, uh, when I was watching another person's uh, uh, um, YouTube channel and they had people from, uh, our revolution, I think it was, uh, or no, uh, United Left, uh, on, and they claimed about the doxing and the communications. Uh, they mentioned the, the media person, I think they mentioned the media person, and definitely the communications person and the campaign manager all talked about doxing and giving them information about other candidates. Uh, again, I, I offered to have them come on and explain what they meant by that. And when I went into comments of, of this YouTube channel, um, and asked uh, where, where are the links to these papers so you know someone who's outside of this can see it and go okay yeah you're right uh, the comment was actually on map be deleted and <laughs> I'm like okay so there's some funny things going on there uh, as far as uh, uh, you know at the left and this YouTube channel and all other stuff so it's kind well, of my research you know and and the thing is is that like they they want to behave as an underdog and i think that the green party has a chronic expectation of failure so as long as they don't succeed in mass right these same people who want to throw little temper tantrums on twitter 
right? Who want to have the final say, like, you can't participate anymore with the Green Party because you pissed me off, right? By being chronic losers, they can stay in control. They can, they can keep these positions, right? For years, but if the Green Party grew, if it got traction, if the membership blew up, they do not have the skills or capability or time, right? Because a lot of these people aren't doing this full time. This is like the stuff they do on the side to feel special. And I, I hate to say that, like, I really hope any Green, anybody who's active in the Green Party doesn't hear that and think I'm like deriding everybody's work. It's not true, but there are some personalities and, and we all know them. Right, we know those personality types that they're satisfied with where they are, right? And it's not everybody, but it was but it was enough people to make the whole thing feel unprofessional. And the reality is like we cannot stay in that mindset anymore. Like the the Democrats and the Republicans are climate deniers. Like the Republicans straight up straight up climate client deniers, right? But the Democrats are like, oh, we'll do something by 2050. That's functionally a climate denier, right? When, when scientists are saying, we don't have till 2030 before this is irreparable. Like you're not gonna see the worst of it until 2050, but we can't do anything about it if we don't do something about it before 2030. Right, and, it, and, it, and that it, it went from 2050 to 2040 to 2030 to like 2027, like that it, it you know, the, the way that it works, we're getting less and less time because we keep polluting and it keeps feeding back into the system. So we've got like no time to be screwing around anymore. You know, like the Democrats and the Republicans are not going to save us. Like they made it very clear with Obama. They've made it very clear with, you know, with the Hillary campaign and then Biden's campaign, like what they did to Bernie. They are not actively interested in the Green New Deal or doing what needs to be done to save this planet. So we have a choice to keep playing like, you know, 0.5%, oh, we tried real hard, you know, or to take this seriously and actually fight. Like, fight like we mean it, fight like professionals, take this seriously. You know, if someone is mean to you on Twitter, just ignore them or issue a press statement, right? Don't get into Twitter beef with candidates if your staff on another campaign, like keep that behind closed doors and duke it out, you know, as a group, as leadership, but you have to lead, you know? And I think that the passion and the concern for you know our planet, for other human beings, the things that really matter, I think the Green Party has in spades, right? I don't think any of these people are bad people or corrupted people, right? I think that we are lucky to have all these, even, even the candidates who talked a bunch of crap about Howie and their campaigns, right? I still think for the most part, those people had good intentions, you know, they just got, they lost sight of the bigger picture of the whole thing, right? They kneecapped the Green Party to throw a tantrum and it's like, was this really the best use of your clout, right? Yeah. Did you need to do that for this cycle? Did you really need to like spend months doing that? Or could have you, or could you have looked at the existential threat to our planet and said, you know what? Nah, I'm going to support Howie, right? I'm going to get behind this and, and give it my all. And we're going to fight as a unified front and not get distracted and divided. And I think that's the biggest problem with the left in general is like, people are like unity, right? Like, that's the that's the the trigger word for the liberals and the democrats is unity right we got to unify we don't have to unify with everybody right we don't have to unify with climate deniers we don't have to unify with people who are anti abortion we don't have to get in the same boat as those people right but when it comes to generally good people who are generally on the same page like let's get in the boat 
let's focus on the goals, right? Green New Deal, Medicare for all, UBI would be great, you know, but like universal education, student loan forgiveness, like these are things we agree on. So let's fight like our little PC battles and our little problems, like, like, like let's duke that out. But when, call, when push comes to shove, let's focus on what we actually want and stick together. Let's not start on, you know, my biggest problem like with Twitter, because people will at me and be like, did you see this person like said this? And like once in a while, you know, it's like real bad. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to be following that person or whatever. But as far as like, getting on the bandwagon of like destroying different accounts maybe they're a jerk but it is a waste of our time you know unless they're actively sowing discord and they're like an infiltrator who's trying to divide us right or they're so vehemently racist or misogynist or predatory that they're a danger to others just block them and move on you know, maybe DM your favorite people and be like, I don't know, you know, but like save your energy and your time for the battles that are worth fighting. Move on from the bots and from the random people who are mentally unwell online, leave it be. Because what people see is not that that person is a jerk. What they see is cancel culture. What they see is bullying. What they see is the left is intolerant, which we should be intolerant of money and politics, of destroying our planet, of mass murder, right, of war. We should be intolerant of those things. We should be in intolerant of racism and sexism and that kind of crap that people spew online, right? But we don't need to be targeting people mercilessly, right? Like you don't need one small account with a hundred followers getting 5,000 comments about how terrible they are. That is a waste of time. And if that person, say that person is actually works for the CIA or is like a conservative, they have succeeded in their goal, right? They have like one crappy post and they have sucked in maybe hundreds of labor hours from people getting them down that rabbit trail. And that is like, dividing the left is like the oligarchy's favorite pastime. Like how can we show up and stir some crap up to get them to divide and just destroy themselves? There's actually whole pages in the CIA manual. There's like a literal manual on how to infiltrate organizations, how to divide them, how to do it. I suggest everybody look it up and actually read it because if you read it, you can see it happening in real time in these social media outlets. Like, it's pretty incredible. It's the same tactics. Just don't fall for it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to like what they said. Just don't waste your time. Like, if you see something terrible like that, right, make a note, maybe tell your favorite people in a DM, block them, and then go spend your time instead of battling with, you know, say a turf or someone who's anti-trans right? And all the emotional energy and all the time that you spend trying to get somebody to acknowledge like trans people are valid, right? That one jerk does not need 50 people telling them that trans lives matter, right? They're either going to get it or they don't, but those 50 people could look up like some way to help trans activism, so if you're like triggered by something terrible somebody said, you're like that's racist, you know? Okay, well then look up BLM, right? Okay, with that energy that you have, is there some sort of petition you could be signing instead of taking the two minutes to like mastercraft a tweet? Could you take two minutes to go find some petitions that desperately need signatures, right? It's just how we use our energy and our time. And I think that right now we have been, I mean, very successfully, we've been distracted and divided. And, and even, even though I think that our programs, our beliefs, like socialism in general, like 
all of this is gaining popularity and traction, but the campaign to prevent it from materializing and to say like a general strike, right, has been exceptionally successful because we, we don't save our energy for the big fight, you know? And I think people undervalue their own time and worth. Like, even if the only way you politically contribute is on Twitter or social media, or God forbid, Facebook, the hellscape that is Facebook, if that's the only way you contribute, you can do more. Like your skills and your potential, like we could use that in all sorts of places, but maybe you don't have time, maybe you have a social phobia, maybe you have a disability. This is the extent that of, of your contributions. It's still a contribution that we could use. You know, it's just I know that, yeah, I use know. it wisely. Yeah, I I I I I, I second that. Uh, I I also understand that the Green Party has like a youth caucus. Is that right? I believe they do. Yes, I think the youth caucus uh, needs to be stopped training and start activating themselves, and be like the voice of the Green Party nowadays. And they should be starting to not act as if the Green Party is a hobby, but is a career. And that's right. one of the that's one of the ways that the Green that the GOP and the Democrats have handled politics. They may have made it their life. So that and you know, the Green Party were, I, I, I'm, I've been struggling to remember the uh, global um, uh, climate uh, activist uh, with the, it's, it's uh, has like a, oh man, uh, uh, extension or some uh, some type. Fact, I, I forget the actual uh, name of, of the organization that has like different bodies to it. But oh man, but if the Green Party can, can reach out to them and get support from them, because they're the, the the organization I'm thinking about is a more extreme version of what the Green Party is and more global in regards. PSL. I'm sorry. Is it PSL? No, I think it's a climate rebellion or rebellious or some effect. Something like that. Um, that climate. Uh, oh man, <laughs> it's gonna bother you in it. Oh no, I'm just. <laughs> uh, I I I have followed them on uh, Instagram, but I can't remember the full name uh, what they are. Um, anyways, I, I'm guessing you know, for now I'm just gonna be glad. I think it's a uh, climate rebe re rebellions. Uh, they uh, do uh, climate actions all, all over the world, and they get all kinds of um, all kinds of attention on the, the oil oil companies and coal companies, and I think yeah, I think climate uh, extension, extortion, uh, uh, something to that effect. Anyway, at, if the, if those two things were to co come into play with the Green Party, I think the Green Party could actually um, could make a big impact on on uh, U.S. policy policymaking and election yeah. overall. Well, and I think the Green Party needs to take a lot of lessons from history, right? And particularly, I think what we need to be looking to is how did the GOP originally form, right? And how did the Whigs go the way of the dinosaur? And so, as far as the GOP. That party was formed from a culmination of the abolition movement, right? And abolitionists weren't just one organ, abolition of slavery, right, 19th century. So abolitionists weren't just one organization. There wasn't like one national, I mean, I think there probably was several national abolition, abolition organizations, but a lot of them, it was like individual churches, individual faiths. Um, I think even you know the Jewish community had abolitionist movements. You know all sorts of different groups, disparate groups, right? Dozens of them had the same shared goal, and they came together. They they maintained their separate groups, their separate interest groups, you know, and identities. But they came together in this huge abolitionist movement to push for it, and from that culmination. Right, the GOP was formed in order to politically activate their desire to end slavery, right? Yeah. And That's that right. was so successful that that party is still around today. They've been basically just running on the fumes of Abraham Lincoln for like 150 years now. Yeah. <laughs> like what has the Republican party contributed? What Her Herbert Hoover? Are we excited about that? Are we excited about Nixon or Reagan or Bush? Like, come on, they haven't contributed anything 
And, after, right? and, and that was good since Abraham Lincoln. I mean, that party's dead, right? It's it it's just been this like wishy-washy party. And while it was like right in the Abraham Lincoln popularity fumes, right? The Democrats had an identity crisis until FDR. Yeah. And FDR revitalized the Democrats and was like, okay, we're not the white segregationist party anymore because the Republic, the GOP has now been co-opted to, to be that. We're gonna be the socialist kind of leaning and union and the people's party. That's what the Democrats are. You know, people kind of look at it as like the balance that we have today is the way it's always been. And it's not even been that way for a century, right? And when we're talking about political timelines, you know, you don't wanna just look at a decade or two decades. You wanna look at generations, right? 30 to 50 years at a time, what is the trajectory of these parties? And our problem right now is we have two right-wing corporatist parties who have been bought out by corporations. It, they were already on that path, but Citizens United pretty much just put the nail in that coffin. So we have no competing party, which is very similar to what, what, what was happening with the Democrats and the Whigs. The people had no party that wanted abolition, right? The government said it knew better, slavery had to stay. It, it, you know, if we got rid of it, there'd be war. There was nothing but excuses and so a new party had to rise out of that. Now for the Green Party, I think that we need to finally get serious. You know, we're, the Green Party is pretty much the only populist party that's populist 100% of the time, right? For the people and social programs and this kind of thing. But that means we have like a lot of issues that nobody's doing anything about and it gets real distracting. But I think climate change, and it is the Green Party, and the Green Party isn't just in America, right? This is an international kind of phenomena of Green Parties. Yeah, I, I, we should I, lean into the international nature of it, oh, yeah. take assistance from other Green Parties, and really nail home that we are the party of climate collapse, of the Green New Deal, because the Green Party wrote the Green New Deal, and then AOC sweeps in and gives the Democrats credit. They didn't write it. Actually, they had nothing to do with that. Actually, the Green New Deal came from England in, in the 70s. Howie Hawkins uh, saw that and made it American. Uh, one. Well, it's, right, but oh, so like, yeah, it's not, on. it's not even that new of a concept. Yeah, no, no, I know, yes. I'm, you uh, know? Yeah, hold on, I wanted to add something here. Uh, uh, and actually, I thought it was the uh, Extinction Rebellion is, is the climate group that I was, I was trying to think of earlier. If they got a, if the Green Party got a hold of them and got some advice from them on how to be more how to be be more extremist as far as the climate and all that stuff, maybe more the message would resonate with today's youth as far as that part goes. And two, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, if memory serves me, uh, did the Thirteenth Amendment, which basically allowed African Americans to be instead of enslaved, be put in prison to uh, to actually to uh, to like replace slavery. Right. You could still slavery could still exist in prison. That's right. Yeah, that's true. That, and that's why they made that they they abolished slavery in the living off of the plantation uh, way of doing things, but they made it, uh, they, that's basically where, where, the, where the police department came from. They were basically slave patrols at one point in time. They basically reserved the right to enslave people to the state. Exactly. Yeah. Private capital gain. Exactly, and that's the reason why they made, uh, they, they did the whole uh, prohibition of alcohol, the pro prohibition of uh, weed and other stuff of that nature to make it easier for the African-American community to be enslaved and within the justice system. That's right, that's right. They incentivized, by leaving that in there, they incentivized legislation that would basically imprison and enslave the American population. I mean, there should be, you know, like under what circumstances is a human right permissible to violate, right? Right. And, it's, uh, and, and like your right to vote, like you have a felony conviction, it's not just about 
you know, enslaving you, it's also taking away your right to vote because you're now a felon. So uh -huh. they've disenfranchised millions of people this way. Okay. But voting is a human right, according to the United States, according to the International Covenant on Economic and Political Rights, or no, econ uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that the US drafted, that we, the treaty we passed around the world is saying, this is the human rights we believe in, right? It included a right to vote. But you're telling me if, if I find someone is guilty of a felony and possession of a pound of marijuana is a felony, right? Okay, now you can't vote, goodbye human right. You know, now you can get slave wages, goodbye human right. Like- uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have like a minute left. Uh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I hated the interrupt, but I was like, uh, but it's about 12 noon in regards to this computer. So uh, do you have any final words as far as uh, this interview goes? And uh, uh, are you actually running for office or are you uh, contemplating the idea right now? I am, but I am not, I, I haven't done my letter of intent or gotten the signatures or done any of that yet. Right now, my focus is on helping the Green Party like basically launch and regroup and we'll go from there, right? Just direct action, finding ways that we can help our communities and really make the Green Party stand for something meaningful. Okay, well, that sounds good. Uh, I appreciate you being on today and I appreciate the uh, lively conversation. I don't have many of those nowadays. Um, well, anyway, uh, but thank you for being on and I look forward to having you on again. Absolutely. I'd love to come back. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you have a good day and uh, wear, wear those masks. <laughs> you too. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.